So what would it have been like if Adam had not chosen independence? Would we still be walking around the garden in the nude? Probably not. Because I think that was symbolic of the innocence that was in place. That wouldn't necessarily mean that you have to stay in a place that is not maturing and ascending. Because I think Adam would have ascended into greater measure of ability and position within the kingdom and within creation. But in terms of restoration and Jesus, yeah, Jesus has to be the embodiment of everything um, that, that are all the promises of God are embodied in him. So all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. And therefore, every promise for reconciliation, restoration, forgiveness, redemption and everything else is in him and is actually in the new covenant. Um that we are included in because he has come into that agreement with God for that restoration. Um, his resurrection obviously is the key element to our receiving life and new life and resurrection life. Um, but we enter into that new covenant. I didn't make a covenant. He made the covenant with God and included me in it. Um, and I think that's the security of it in that he has embodied and fulfilled all that was required to bring us into a restored relationship and has included me and you and all of us in that um, without our needing to do anything other than discover it to come into the realization of what he's already done so the finished work of jesus is exactly that finished we can't add anything to it. Just come to the full realization of all it means. And of course, that is an ongoing process. We may know one or two things to begin with, and then we discover more and more and more of the amazing things that Jesus has accomplished uh, through who he is. You know, so definitely when we're thinking of restoration, don't think of something that goes on outside of jesus or without jesus or you know something we have to accomplish or something that's accomplished automatically it is something which is at work through who he is to his full expression of the image of god who colossians 2 talks about you know through him created everything and through him reconciles everything um, and I think all is very much included within all, you know, I think there's so many alls in the Bible and most of them in terms of are relating to the all inclusiveness of who Jesus died for, who Jesus died with, who Jesus died as, and who all who are resurrected, all who are reconciled all who are forgiven you know there's just alls right throughout particularly the new testament that shows no one is excluded or left out of that amazing uh, work that he has done so yeah definitely the embodiment of everything yeah that's terrific um you mentioned this um, immortality conference in november with yeah. lindy with uh with justin interestingly justin just had an it was um was part of an immortality conference uh here in texas and in, in the u.s about a month ago i i actually attended uh okay. the conference live now what's interesting mike so i was there we were we were there uh, i was there and then um literally the next day i was so sick laid out on my couch i couldn't even get up and so i and so I know that I know that that was, you know how that is. We are overcomers. You know, we, we have to go through those things to overcome. And then Justin was on, had his Zoom call the following Sunday and shared with everybody that he he was sick after the conference as well. So mm -hmm. there, were, there, there was a lot of things that were stirred up within that immortality conference. And then 
Um, as you probably are aware, I don't know if you are aware, but Lindy Strong has has started a monthly yes uh, situation to engage immortality, which which I find fascinating. It's really kind of um, that that gift, that inheritance gift, has really kind of come strong mm. in the body right now. And just wanted to get your perspective on that. I I know you through the Engaging God program, have talked a lot about immortality, but kind of more under the radar, but now it's just kind of seems more front and center. Yeah. I mean, I guess the last um, six sessions that I've done on the Patreon group encompassing unconditional love were essentially immortality um, in that God can't unconditionally love us and want us to die. Yeah. So within the sort of remit of unconditional love is bound to be immortality because God wants no end to the relationship that he has with us. And that is physical as well as spiritual. Um, I think uh, I guess, you know, as I've gone through healing to health, wholeness, immortality has been a journey in which. I have grown in my understanding and experience of it, you know, having not been sick for, I don't know, 30 years, I guess, um, <laughs> not having, uh, have any concept of, of sickness in that sense. Um, it inevitably leads to, well, if you're not sick, then there's no read to die because generally you die because of some sort of illness or some disease or something else. So if you don't get sick, you're not likely to die, but it goes beyond that into the quality of the life rather than the quantity of it. You know, in a sense, a lot of people, if you ask them, would you like to live to go forever in your present state? They'd probably say no, uh, because they're not happy or they're not content or they've not found out their identity or purpose. So immortality is not just, well, we're not going to die, but it's the quality of eternal life live now which means embracing the full capacity of who we were always intended to be as sons of god and outworking that in our everyday life so i certainly embrace immortality in that we put it on we clothe ourselves which immense to accepting believing living in the reality of what was always intended and therefore not giving room for any other way of thinking if you're in doubt or unbelief towards it which is where the the problems come in when you get symptoms of sickness or disease or whatever else it causes us then to have to contend with immortality because you're having to face well i'm believing this but the evidence is contradictory to it. So I do feel that accepting the reality of it has to be outworked in practice. And therefore, how do you do that? And I think clothing yourselves or putting on immortality is putting the truth onto the facts and changing the facts to align to the truth. And that requires our involvement. It's not just that we're immortal, end of, full stop. We're encouraged to embrace that. And I think it, as in everything in, in the Christian life, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you continue to focus on the negative, then the likely is that you will essentially manifest the negative. If you focus on the positive, then you're more likely to manifest the positive in the way you live. Because the way we think is what's a result of what's programmed in our heart. As a man thinks in his heart, it's because you're thinking according to what's programmed in your heart. So the programming needs to be replaced. It's like having a new operating system. You can have a whole new operating system. You know, in the past, we've upgraded from, you know, Windows 2 point something to 3 point something to, you know, eventually moving up to Vista. Oh, that terrible Vista into, 
you know, various versions of Windows, eventually Windows 10, Windows 11, um, and you've changed the operating system, but you still have to have the programs that run on it. I can't have an immortality operating system and then keep running programs that are designed for another operating system. You know, something that's designed for a iOS or, or Apple won't actually run on Windows as it stands. So we've got to try and make sure we match how we think, speak, act and at work that in reality and not contradict it because it just won't work if you try and run programs designed for one operating system on another. So we need a complete overhaul, not just of what's programmed within us, but how we outwork that programming in our thinking, emotions and everything else. So, you know, I can't say, well, I believe in immortality and then I, I live in fear. Because Hebrews talks about the fear of death has kept the whole of mankind in bondage. So I can't live in fear and think, well, I believe in immortality. Well, I'm hoping for immortality. That was what that really means. When some people say, well, I believe I'm immortal. What they're really saying is, I hope I am. It's a wish. But it, but if pushed, then their thinking and everything else isn't aligned to it. So I think it's a complete makeover, overhaul of the way we think, feel, what our belief systems are, the programming of that within our whole being. And then the full manifestation of it is living the unrestricted and, and unlimited because the quality of the immortal life, the abilities of immortal life is in non-linear and multi-dimensional reality. I'm not going to be restricted to one plane of existence. I'm designed to live in multiple planes of existence. I'm designed to live them simultaneously. So I'm not going to, well, I'm linear. I'm living on earth and then I'm going to go to heaven and then I'm going to do this and then I'm coming back to earth. No, I can dwell in all of them and abide and live in all of it because that's how we were intended to be as beings created with an immortal perspective we're designed to be able to be unlimited and unrestricted by the physical plane so we can occupy the physical spiritual and dimensional planes of existence all at the same time because we were designed to be able to operate in a non-linear fashion and all of that i think is part of realizing the fullness of our potential as sons and living at that potential, you know, um, which means quite a lot of deconstruction and renewing of our minds to actually know the truth, but then to live in that truth. Because um, a lot of people will accept, oh, yeah, I can be multiple. And then you say, well, how does that work for you? And they can't answer you because they believe it's true, but they're not living in that truth yet, which is OK, because we're all on a journey. Um, but God wants us to embrace the fullness of our sonship, which will carry with it a whole different quality of life, which is beyond, well, as Justin would say, beyond human. It is beyond the limitations of humanity. Because mankind were made in the image of God. They were not supposed to create their own image. Humanity is the image that has been created by ourselves. And I'm not going to be restricted by being human because I'm not human. I'm a son of God. I'm created to be beyond purely human, living in a human plane of existence, to live in a completely different realm of sonship. And I think that's what the father is really wanting to help us embrace and uh, and begin to live out. You know, um, so definitely. Your immortality is definitely the, on the father's agenda to get people to begin to think of the possibility and then to embrace the possibility and then to go and live the possibility as a reality. And of course, if you're going to live forever, then it poses a whole lot of other questions. 
in terms of well how and where and what you're going to do and how you're going to eat and I mean all the questions which I think some of the com- conference that Justin went on and others are beginning to pose the question well what is the economy of immortality are we going to live on a financial plane you know or are we going to live above finances in that the economy of well-being in that just me being totally and absolutely completely content and fulfilled in being me will free me from any need of recognition from other people or producing self image or any of those things because i won't need that anymore and therefore money is often a result of value and worth if you earn more money you carry a higher value to society than other people and your self-worth is programmed into what makes you valuable and often the financial thing is what makes people valuable in the world's eyes If you earn more money, then you must be more valuable and you are worth more. Whereas actually God wants us to see that it's the image that he made us in. He created us with value and worth intrinsically attached to who we are. And therefore, I believe an economy of immortality is one free from money. Now, that doesn't mean that we um won't have a system that works but actually if everyone is doing what everyone was designed to do no one will be need to be paid for it because everyone will support one another out of what we're all designed to do so if we were living in let's say a restoration city if me i'm doing what i'm doing and other people are doing what they're doing makes the whole thing function And we won't need a hierarchical way of looking at it. So I'm blessing someone and someone's blessing me. That's covenant. So a the economy of immortality is covenant. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. And we all have enough. For all our needs and an abundance of overflow, because Jesus promised us abundant life which is life in all its fullness therefore what i see is if you remove the limitations of identity that comes through humanity then you remove the programming that humanity has placed upon people which is works based performance oriented worth and value and all i have to be is to be me and if we're all as god intended us to be then we're not comparing us with each other i'm not saying well i'm doing a more important job than you therefore i'm worth more because i only need to be me and you only need to be you therefore you value each other for who you are not what you do that removes the need for financial remuneration money doesn't have to make the world go round And I think that is really where we will come to when we begin to look at what will this mean in practical terms of how will we live if we embrace immortality and what changes will that make to the world in which we live in if people are beginning to live that way. And I think it will have a significant change in our attitudes and our mindsets towards each other, to the world because my sonship is linked to creation and creation values me as a son and creation gives me a place within its overall sense because creation is longing and waiting for the revealing of the sons of god so creation could be set free so there's a vested interest to creation for me to be me because that will tie into creation's freedom so i believe there's a lot of thinking to do and questions to be asked not just the very simplistic thing oh great i'm going to live forever it's like well what does that mean Uh, and how is that going to work 
Because unless people start thinking about it and beginning to embrace God about what his ways are in it, then we'll just come up with more solutions, which will be man-made and will be a repeat of the things where we've gone wrong in the past. So I don't want to create something based on a previous image. I want something new, something based on how God intended it to be. So what would it have been like if Adam had not chosen independence? Would we still be walking around the garden in the nude? Probably not. Because I think that was symbolic of the innocence that was in place. That wouldn't necessarily mean that you have to stay in a place that is not maturing and ascending. Because I think Adam would have ascended into greater measure of ability and position within the kingdom and within creation. It's very difficult to imagine what something could be without the influence of what has been. So well, that's why deconstruction is important, that we are embracing what God intended rather than what we have developed or created. And I think there's a sense where I do not want my immortality based on the ingenuity of man. Hence, I don't believe I'm going to need nanotechnology or other things to keep me alive. Now, I know there are people out there who are looking to develop that stuff and talking about that we will, in a sense, prolong life because we will have overcome some of the things that are associated with death, whether it be sickness, disease or other things. But I don't believe that's how God intended it to be. I think that is still man's best effort to replicate what God can do without the technology. And therefore, am I opposed to that? No, in that I'd rather people had the opportunity of eventually discovering true reality and therefore not dying in the meantime. And therefore, if there can be technology which in increases man's age limits and all that i'm not against that but i don't believe ultimately that is the fullness of it i think that is a transition that we go through the same transition we're going through within healing technologies and modalities in terms of technology or right frequencies or other things i don't think ultimately that is how we're intended to stay healthy I think we're standing to stay healthy because we are healthy and our whole mindset and being functions from that way of thinking because our thinking generates how we live. And if we focus from an immortality measure of thinking, I think that can keep us in immortality without the need for technology. But it's great that people are beginning to think about and talk about it um for me it's just not the end game you know <laughs> you know and and it may raise the profile of immortality and more and more people are beginning to discover and think about it and you know they may well discover some of the causes that causes cell to die and they may well discover how you can reprogram the cells to re replicate and renew themselves and other things and they may discover that but you can also do that by being one spirit, soul and body and living from that place that is choosing the reality we live from aligned to the father's heart for us. Which, you know, is part of, I believe, where we're coming into maturity. You know, wow. but, you know the world is living in a place where we're all on a journey or coming towards something. So for those who have got no idea of how to live in health or even to find healing, then the medical profession and the hospitals are quite useful in keeping people alive. If they can't keep themselves alive, then better that they get medical support and live longer than not. I'm not against all that because it helps the people who are in that place of needing it. 
as you then move on, you then become less dependent on those type of systems in that then you can generate your own health from the energy of immortality, which is within us because we have energy gates that are generated from abundant life that can generate energy across all of our being, including the physical body because living water is flowing within us you could say that you know immortal life is flowing in us we just have to focus that life into the right place and for most people that life is cooped up beyond doors within our spirit that we've not opened so we've got trickles of it coming under the threshold of the door well i want it going beyond the trickle to ankle deep knee deep waist deep until it's flowing in a whole energetic system of immortality yeah. you know um but you i think it's it's helpful to know how to do that until it becomes instinctively programmed within our unconscious you know i don't any longer every day think about well how am i going to focus the energy into the seven energy gates how am i i don't need to think that anymore i am that you know i've gone beyond linearly doing that to it now is my whole model of thinking but to get there i had to go through the process of doing it every day so i focus the rivers of living water into the merkaba in the core of my being i energized that with immortality if you like then i and then i directed that towards the energy gates that are within my physical being to focus that energy for all the things I need to do. And, and part of that is actually keeping myself alive in with immortal life, you know, because I can choose to focus that energy. Yeah. But we can learn, you know, we can learn to grow and mature until it becomes us. It's a state of being rather than doing. You know, that I don't have to consciously choose to flow that energy. It is part of my unconscious self that is, you know, it's like I don't have to think about pumping the blood around my body, keeping my heart pumping. All of the things that my physical body does, I don't have to think about that. That's programmed unconsciously. You know, I don't have to think, oh, better breathe, I better breathe, I better breathe. I just breathe. You know, I don't think, oh. How many beats a minute do I want my heart to pump? I better get oh, 60 that generates. I, it's just totally instinctively programmed. Well, I can, we can program immortality like that until it just becomes who we are. But most people aren't disciplined enough to actually focus like that. They just hope for the best and think, oh, well, immortal, it'll just happen. No, we have to actually choose to live in that reality and lose to to embrace in the source of immortal life. Jesus said, if you drink from the fountain or springs of life, you'll live forever, effectively, but you have to drink it. You know, it's something we choose to embrace. That is the source, literally he is the source it is spirit it is life that's the source that's in me it's not an external source it's not the fountain of youth somewhere or some youth serum that i take that source is bubbling up within me and will never run out jesus said if you drink from this you'll never run out as he talked to the woman at the well You know, it was like, drink from this source and you're never going to be thirsty again. You know, which means it is perpetual. You know, it is bubbling up. And I think that is really the key. It is drawing from the right source. You know, and that becomes your only source. Then you don't eat to live. You eat to fellowship and enjoy. So you're living from a different type of perspective. And I do believe that's God's intention for all of us to come to that state of being. 
and to dwell and live in that state of being, which will free us from living according to the world around us, which I think is, you know, living from an immortal state means I'm not subject to the laws and things around me in this world, which is being restored until it's fully restored. I don't want to live connected to death. So I'm not having my mindset connected to death, but people are dying all around me. You know, one of my really good friends died yesterday, you know, um, and you know, it, it's, you, you have the emotions of that. I know where he, you know, I know where he is, you know, and I know he's in a better place physically, you know, in that sense um, now, but you know, I I'm, I'm, don't believe that was God's intention for him. But we all have to come to that place and that reality, you know, and as much as, you know, over the last couple of years, you know, people who I know have died and some of them believed in immortality, but they still died. Am I going to allow that to stop me living in immortality? No. But I do feel for those who have been involved and left behind and all the emotions of people, uh, you know, it's absolutely tragic and heartbreaking and, you know, sorrowful for those who are now grieving and all of that. But just because things aren't there yet doesn't stop me knowing the truth of what God's intention is and therefore his desire to restore immortality to all of us you know that was so powerful i mean uh, I, i'm getting whacked just sitting here uh, i just want to encourage everyone to look at this book into the dark cloud my wife and i just started reading it and it is just taking us to another level it's taking us to where god wants us to be um so i have a question within a question yeah we recently heard a message um, which we don't necessarily totally agree with, but there's some great things in that message. Uh, one of the things that I saw uh, and heard was something about righteousness and holiness and justice working for that. Well, I don't quite understand it, but what I do understand is that um, looking at scriptures, We've looked at scriptures through the eyes of, of an angry God, hmm. as you've said before, and uh, looked at scriptures as trying to meet up to God's standards, which is kind of what I got from this message that we listened to. Um, I look at uh, Joseph. I look at the woman who committed adultery. I look at David. I look at everyone who's... Uh, uh, sinned in the scriptures and how God dealt with them and but I don't really think that scriptures paint a correct image of what it was saying and the reason I say that is because I believe there's the real side or the real gospel or the real God that is loving unconditional and it really is all about a relationship. It really is all about intimacy with God. It's really all about uh, how we walk with God, not so much about our past mistakes and our failures, but because what I heard in this message was, well, if you want to be blessed by God, you have to be holy and righteous, and you have to meet those standards. And I just didn't buy into that. No. The reason I didn't buy into that is because, well, what if Joseph gave in to that temptation? What if he gave in to that? Would God still have blessed him and given him a dream and a vision? I believe he would have. I believe he would have, despite our human condition. And this is where we need to have a different mindset and, and not a sin mindset. We need to have a mindset of God's grace and love and care for us. And I believe there's millions of men and women out there who have blown it, who've had made mistakes like myself and have 
have repented and have come out of that and say, no, God, I believe in you for more. I'm believing you for who you really are. And I believe that comes through relationship and intimacy, just as you've been saying. And I just want to thank you for that. And I'm just going to be quiet and okay. see what you have to say. I mean, I think, I think part of the problem is people are trying to interpret their understanding of God through the Bible that was written to people in context that were living in a different age and a different understanding so all of those who were living in the old covenant in the old in the old testament their relationship with god was not that god was in them and they were not living in the same perspective of who god really is so just because they interpreted things about god in a particular way doesn't mean it's true so I'm not going to look at the Old Testament for my understanding of God because it was written by people who didn't know God. Now, when the prophets started to come along, they started to prophesy out of a new perspective. Oh, you didn't want sacrifices and offerings. You didn't require them. A new covenant is coming where you're going to write things on our hearts. It's not about this keeping this legislation or whatever. You know, and maintaining a standard is about our works to create something in our lives that then God will honor. So I've got to maintain a standard of holiness or whatever it might be. And of course, everyone's standard is different depending on which way they're looking at it. No, I am already meeting God's standard because I am in Christ and Jesus met God's standard. I didn't have to. He did it for me. So he died my death. I died with him. I was resurrected with him. I'm made alive with him. I've been made righteous. I have been justified. I've been forgiven. I've been reconciled. And he did all of that without me having to do anything. I just have to accept who I actually am from his perspective. And if I'm trying to meet some standard that we set, I'm never going to succeed because I don't have the ability in my own strength to meet any form of standard, which is why Jesus met the standard for me. I don't have to be obedient to God. Because if I'm trying to be obedient, what am I trying to do? Obey some form of law. I don't have to try and please God by my behavior. I'm already pleasing to him because he only sees me as righteous. God keeps no record of the wrongs of my life. People love to keep records of our wrongs because it gives them power over us. But God keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. It very clearly says in 2 Corinthians 5 19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not holding their trespasses against them it very clearly says in Colossians that every accusation made against me has been nailed to the cross and Jesus dealt with all of them and overcame all of the accusations so if I'm justified then that is a legal term that basically says I am not guilty of any offense because I am now justified. So someone has looked and said, no, you are now justified. Therefore, you're not guilty of this. Like I am now righteous. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I didn't make myself righteous. He declared me to be righteous. So it's something he has done. I didn't reconcile myself to God. God reconciled me to himself. He didn't need to reconcile himself to me because he, he was never, ever not reconciled to me. But I was not reconciled because I felt separated from him. But actually, he reconciled him me to himself so I could accept how he's always seen me. You know, and you, you look at the 
uh, all of some of these things and you find there's a lot of alls that people take the Adam side of the all but they don't take the Jesus side of the all so all died in Adam yes everyone has died in Adam everyone's a sinner but they then don't go on to take all were made alive in Christ so everyone's not a sinner anymore they're righteous and you have things you know like uh, sort of the typical scriptures which sort of say you know all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God you know that type of thing from Romans chapter 3 you know so everyone accepts that oh yeah all have sinned and fall short of God so none of us is any is is good enough which is absolutely true in our own strength but when you actually read it and i never saw this because i only looked at the all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god it then goes on in verse 24 to say being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in christ jesus so that all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god are all justified as a gift same all you know all sinned absolutely all lost their identity identity all now have been given restored identity because our identity is not sinner it is saint it is son of god so when you read those type of things we always focus and the evangelical system always focuses on the first part of everything and never follows it through so all that does is bring guilt and condemnation onto people oh uh, you all sinned you're all guilty sinners blah 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 and they don't get the fact that sin is actually a noun which is talking about our lost identity and of course, all of us have fallen short of our true identity in living in lost identities. Nothing to do with the behavior per se, but the behavior is outworking. Sinned is outworking the lost identity. That is what it's talking about. So everyone has lived out of lost identity. And of course, they're fallen short of how God created them to be but being justified as a gift by his grace same all that's the reality of it you know and you sort of only get one part of it with the evangelical gospel and actually that evangelical gospel is not good news you know and ultimately people kept are stuck in the old identity of then having to try and do something to be acceptable to god to be holy and live a holy life or meet some form of standard when actually god has set the standard jesus is the standard and i'm in him and god sees me through who i am now i am made righteous now, if we keep thinking in sin consciousness, if we keep thinking in that lost identity, then we'll keep operating out of a lost identity. And I would say evangelical Christianity keeps people operating in lost identity because they keep operating as, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, I was once living in lost identity and God's love saved me by his grace. So now I can live in true identity. That is no longer my identity. That was how I once thought about myself. I no longer think about myself that way. And I think it's really important to begin to embrace the whole gift of it and all that God has done through the cross, through Jesus. And I'm included not because I've done anything to deserve it, because he included me in it. That is what grace and mercy is all about. You know, so we need to start focusing on not the works that we need to attend, but the work that has been finished. Jesus finished the work. We have nothing more to add to it. We just have to say thank you. 
for what you have done and accept and embrace all that he has done. Then you won't have these messages of, well, you've got to meet this standard and you've got to perform in this. And you've got to keep up this and or you've got to be holy to be acceptable to God. And, you know, and then you won't have to do all this penance because penance is what you do. One way or another, you do penance, whether it's praying a prayer, or asking for forgiveness, you do penance. Well, reality is what God wants us to do is agree with him, which is what the word metanoia really means. Not do penance, but to agree with who he says I am, that I am the righteous of God in Christ. I'm accepting and agreeing with him. I'm agreeing with the thoughts that he has about me. You know, and I think that is the important aspect of a lot of this. You know, we've got to realize that the Jesus has done the work. He has completed and finished everything necessary. We can add not one thing to that. Thank you, Mike. You, you really just nailed it. <laughs> I mean, it's just God's grace, God's love, his mercy. And really, our mindsets, my wife and I, we've just like, made a 360 change seven years ago and um you know it, it's it's all about relationship hmm. it's all about love it's all about knowing that god not only has forgiven us but he has blessed us and he wants to give us more so yeah. we're not limited by what man is 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 giving us today like you said i mean even when you talked about healing I posted something about the med beds. They mm -hmm. talked about the med beds was, is operated by frequency and sound. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. We will be able to heal ourselves through God's frequency, yes. through God's sound. And his sound is the sound of love, which reaches the end of the universe, the cosmos. That's why we have it. <laughs> and, and we are learning to operate in that. So thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, we love you guys. And okay. that's it. Yeah. I mean, just so it, it's simple. It's not complicated, but it's not been made easy because we've been programmed into believing something different. You know, it's like we've been told that all fall short of the glory of God. That's what we've been told. But we haven't been told that we've all been justified and made righteous. And it's the same all. It is inclusive of everybody. That God has justified and made everyone righteous. And so here's a word that evangelicals could hang on. The words Jesus spoke where he said, Mike, Dave, Christy, Ben, you will do all that I did and even greater. Yeah. Restoration of all things, including creation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But it's embracing that in the it's not just a done deal. I cannot do those things if I'm operating at a lost identity. But if I'm operating at a true identity, yeah, I can do everything. I can do all those things that God created me for. Because he created me to be so that all of those things flow out of my being. Yeah, and that is who he made me to be. But if I am still trying to do it in my own strength, I will just get weary and burdened and trying, you know, worn out with it all. So I don't have to do it in my own strength. You know, and I think that is something for all of us to actually embrace, to embrace who we really are and live out of that true new identity, that new identity of sonship that I am a son of God made in his image and likeness to do all the things that Jesus did do, but I actually go beyond that into not needing to do them. Because if everyone was, 
healthy, I wouldn't need to heal anybody, would we? No. So it's going beyond the sick condition of mankind that Jesus came to, who needed demonstrations of God's love in healing and what was possible, into people living in health and wholeness, which was living beyond what Jesus did into a greater measure of life. Because Jesus came into a fallen position of a group of people who had no idea who God was and were suffering the consequences of living in their own identity because they were living in a fallen identity who people were going to die because that was conditioned. When you live in a greater identity that you don't need to die, then you're not going to be restricted and limited by that old mindset and belief system. And I do believe God wants us to shift away from, you know, all of the works-based perspective to it, yeah. to embrace fully the grace finished work perspective of it all. Yeah. You know, and this is beginning to spread. You know, you know, this sort of grace awakening network which is developing, bringing together people who will believe in the full grace of God and the finished work is beginning to spread. You know, the message is getting out there. You know, and I like the fact that people are beginning to be proactive. You know, so this sort of Grace Awakening Network, which starts on Roku TV on, I think, in March, will give lots of different perspectives on grace. From all sorts of different angles and i i would encourage people to embrace that and share that and get other people to start listening to a grace perspective because it's going to be quite refreshing from the you need to you know maintain this righteousness holiness and perspective to your life to know living grace and it's not in living in oh license because when you live in the grace of God, that empowers you not to live anywhere else. You know, I think people have got the total wrong end of the, what grace means. Grace is the empowerment, the empowerment of God to live as we were intended to live. It is not, oh, grace covers, covers over your stuff where you're not. God's already forgiven us. So we don't have to be focusing on, you know, the whole greasy grace and license to sin. Oh, well, if you're not going to be punished, then you might as well carry on sinning. Well, Paul knocked that one on the head straight away. You know, are we then to continue in this lost identity so grace may increase? No, grace has already increased. Yeah. So we can live in that true identity. You know, let's embrace that. You know, let's fully embrace what jesus has accomplished in that finished work and then we won't get tied to the performance of trying to earn that or live up to it or measure up to it all we have to do is just come into agreement with who god says we are and live out of that perspective because that is holy be holy as i'm holy it is being set apart as a, a like a son of God, the true nature of who we are. You know, his justice is outworked in the you are forgiven. There's the verdict of the cross. The whole mankind who went astray and followed Adam into death has now been made alive in Christ. The whole of mankind. Therefore, that is justice. You are forgiven. You are alive in Christ. The verdict of the cross is not guilty. The verdict of the cross is innocent. So what is there to punish? Well, ultimately, people punish themselves by living in a less than kind of life, which is what religion promotes live in a less than kind of life because that less than kind of life will keep you dependent on going through the religious system 
to be acceptable to God. Whether you have to take the sacraments or do any of the things, read your Bible, pray every day, all of the rules of evangelical Christianity, you have to do these things to maintain your righteousness, holiness, so that God's justice will be at work. And if you don't, well, then you are going to be condemned. Well, the reality is there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, because God doesn't condemn anyone. And Jesus didn't come to condemn anyone. He said, I didn't come to condemn anybody. The condemnation happens because you live in the state that you're already in. You're condemned to that state. If you want to live in lost identity, you're condemned to live in that state of lost identity. Condemnation is nothing to do with punishment. It is a penalty. It's like it's a much less than kind of life than God ever intended us to live in. And if you want to live in that, you can. And therefore you suffer living in that less than kind of life. But God hasn't condemned you to live in it. You've condemned yourself to live in it by choosing to accept that you still are operating in that. Whereas if you choose to accept what God says, that you are righteous, you're not going to live in that. Yeah. And the process of having our minds renewed is renewing our minds to agree with what God has already done and said and thought about us which is we are justified we are righteous we are reconciled we are forgiven yeah you know, that is the done deal from god's perspective let's make sure it's the done deal from ours because i think that's the key if we're not thinking in alignment with god then we're going to be thinking in alignment with something else and that will keep us living in that less than kind of life, sadly. You know, but Jesus did it all. We were all died with him and we're all buried with him and we're all resurrected with him. And essentially, we're all ascended with him as well, because we're all seated with Christ in heavenly places. You know, and it says with not in. Because I'm not in Christ in that realm if you like, is that that concept of being in Christ is being in the finished work of Christ and being in the relationship with him. But I sit with him in heavenly places, plural. So I have been died, buried, resurrected and ascended. All in him. Because he raised me up and seated me in heavenly places with Christ. I didn't do it myself. Neither did I do any other things myself. But I certainly embraced the fullness of what he's done. Because it's a perfect, complete and finished work. Which is pretty awesome. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.